Hello everyone, my name is Alessandro and this is the Temple of Surf, the podcast will give you full access to the best surfers, skaters, shapers, surfboard collectors, shop owners in the world. Discover with me their stories, the greatest successes, amazing behind the scenes and much more. Hello, welcome to the fifth episode of our podcast. Today's guest from Australia is Richard Harvey. We discuss with him about surfboard, surfboard shaping and much more. Mahalo. Hi Richard, welcome to the show. Where are you today? I'm at Burley Heads today. I've just come home from work. I've been uh, in the shaping bay, in the glassing bay, bits and pieces of everything today, and the surf is absolutely cracking on the Gold Coast today. Kira's been five to six foot, wow. barrels going off everywhere, Oki and Paco and all the crew all into it. It's, um, it's what the Gold Coast is all about. Definitely. Amazing place to be as a, as a human being, but especially as a surfer. So I'm, 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 very, I'm very happy to hear about uh, that the surf is good. Today, we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about your career. We're going to talk about surf and shaping. The first question that I have for you is, in your opinion, what is the most important thing in surfing? Having fun. <laughs> That's the best thing, enjoying waves. And I always say to people, when they have a good day in the surf, they don't come home and yell at the missus and kick the cat. <laughs> and if you can build a surfboard that makes them happy and not do that, then, uh, then life's pretty good. Yes, definitely. Like it has a, such an impact on the on our soul that a good session of surfing is helping to solve a lot of problems, right? Well, it it takes you into a world that um, a lot of people don't really understand. And when you ride waves, we're not riding a piece of water. We're riding the energy of the universe. We're riding the wind and the tides and the spinning of the planet. And this is why surfing is so addictive because we are hooked into all of these energies. And uh, when you get a hold of that and it becomes part of your life, it's part of your life forever. And whether you're in the entry level of surfing or whether you've been surfing for a long time, it's the same thing. You get hooked on that energy and um, life is, uh, is just opened up for you definitely i uh, totally agree with you and uh, this um, topic of uh, energy comes uh, in a lot of podcast episodes that i have done and uh, it definitely is something that you cannot explain without trying right it's like a well, road in a certain way <laughs> uh, it's like a glass of water you can look at it and it's totally clear but as soon as you uh, taste it it becomes refreshing and um, and quenches your thirst. So simple things in life are pretty good. I totally agree with you. What is uh, What was the, uh, your first surfboard? So we go back in the time, right? Uh, how did you start surfing? What, what happened back then? When I was really young, I was a country boy. I used to live in the, uh, in the backwoods of New South Wales, and we used to go to the beach for our Christmas holidays. And as a seven or eight year old, I was a little bit intimidated by the surf. I didn't like all that frothy stuff. I liked all the uh, the swimming pools that we had along the edge of the beaches. And then when we moved to the coast, I ended up riding a surfer plane, which was like one of those ru rubber blow up surf mats that Australia was pretty famous for. Very surf mat was very popular in the fifties and sixties. And then from then on. When I moved uh, near the coast, some of the boys that were around the area just started riding boards that were uh, balsa boards. So I started my surfing career um, on, on balsa boards. They weren't around for too long because it was only between about 58 and 60 that balsa started to disappear and then foam came in. And then I ended up buying secondhand boards off the local hotshots and that's where it pretty much started for me. But I lived near the beach, walking distance, probably only a couple of hundred metres from the beach. So after school, all the mates and myself, we'd all hang out down the beach and uh, run amok. <laughs> 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 as, the, 
as the Australian expression goes. And those balsa wood boards, you still have them by any chance or or they uh, disappear? No. The one that the one that I had, I think it might have been a cut down from a big old balsa board. It was very thin and very flat. And I've never been really a collector of any of my old boards because I've had a couple of situations where people that are collectors go, oh, this one's for sale. And they want they want money that's just I think I can build 10 boards myself for something like that. Mm. So um I just went, someone else can be a collector, I'll be the I'll be a shaper. <laughs> that was a, that was a much better option for me. I see that. I see your point. Yeah, of course. And if you have 10 for one, it's a good deal. <laughs> the other thing too is you've got to store them somewhere mm. and you've got to carry them around when you move from one house to the next they get damaged they get they just get old and i go oh, i've i've got surfing as a memory rather than the surfboard i always say the surfboard is the vehicle that we use to go surfing on and it's riding the waves that is the important thing and the boards are important but the riding of the waves is what it's really about yeah, of course. Uh, of course, the uh, surfboard is the vi- vehicle, right? <laughs> Without that, <laughs> there would not be surf or body surf in some cases, right? Well, I, we used to do that too before leg ropes. You, you needed to be able to body surf because if you lost your board, you needed to be able to catch a wave in to uh, pick it up. So when I grew up, a lot of the younger guys, we body surfed, we rode surf mats, um, we rode surfboards, and then most of the early good surfers were all shapers. If you look back and you look at all the good surfers that coming out of California or even Australia in the early 60s, yeah, the good surfers were all shapers. They were the ones that were building boards that were just for them to ride waves on. So the better the boards, the better the surfing became. That's the revolution of uh, surfboard, right? But uh, I, I spoke, uh, I had the opportunity to speak with, uh, I don't know, uh, Joy Cabell, for instance, or uh, the late Greg Knoll. And they told me at that time, you know, the first surfboard that they ever made, they were, they were there. They, they, it was like kind of a trial and error process, right? You were building your own surfboard, but you were surfing on it, so you were you knew what was uh, right or wrong. And I spoke with the son of uh, Eric Gordon. He's the son of Gordon and Smith, you know, and he was sending me my father and his friend. They were, they didn't create this company to sell surfboard. Initially, they created this company to produce surfboard for them <laughs> to surf. And I thought it was very interesting and very nice. Um, I came from a different angle. My entry into the surfboard industry was all about that I was very one of the very early professional surfers along with Nat and Midget in Australia. Mm. And I used to get paid not very much. It was about $15 a week. And um, I'd get a car with some petrol that had the uh, my sponsor's name written all down the side. And then when there was no surf, I'd go into the factory and I'd go, I want to do something, teach me something. And so for about six months, all I did was cut plan shapes. And then for another six months, all I did was get this big electric planer that was probably about 15, 16 inches long that the carpenters used to use and cut down all the blanks. And so my first surfboard was probably not so much um, a board, but uh, an experience of learning how to cut plan shapes and use the planer and work my way into it into things. My my first surfboards, to tell you the truth, weren't very good. <laughs> I suppose a lot of people say that when they first started. I was always more interested in surfing than shaping, but I found that by building good surfboards, my surfing improved and I wanted to understand the dynamics of how surfboards worked. And that's where I've spent a lot of my later years in the surfing industry of just trying to work out what's what works. And now, as we understand the smaller dynamics of design, it's now gone into the intricacies of um, surfboard shaping rather than just a planned shape or the fins or the planned shape. Definitely. And for you, it was a, an opportunity to be around shapers, to, to learn their craft and 
and then down down the road uh, uh, is the job that uh, you you did for the last fifty years, right? So yes, that's right. Well, <laughs> some of those shapers, and there were some great people that came in. Um, Bob Kennison was one of the guys that was one of the early shapers in the 60s and he's still shaping now as far as I'm aware. So I know he's still around um, down at Crescent Heads. But um, he came into my shaping bay when I thought I'd shaped a, a really good surfboard and just did big circles and crosses and things and he went, that's a lump, that's a hollow, that's not right, that's wrong, <laughs> and sort of opened my eyes to what surfboards were. And then as I moved around the world and shaped with different people, whether it was people like Malcolm Campbell over in Hawaii that does the bonzes or Peter Cornish or Dick Van Stralen. I gather information from all of these people and I go, that's really good, that technique is really good or I really like the way they do that. And even today when I do my surfboard shapers workshops where I teach people how to shape, there might be somebody that comes in and does something and I go, that's really a good technique. I'm going to utilise that technique. So my shaping journey hasn't hasn't stopped. It hasn't got to a point where I go, oh, I think I've got it. It's just it's a continuation, just yeah. a continuation of an evolution, just like surfboard design in general. Definitely, definitely. It never stops. And uh, there are there is a, actually every surfer can really uh, improve their own uh, uh, surfboards yes. according to, to who they are. You know, like I was talking, um, uh, you know, like now the Olympics in 11 days, the Tokyo Olympics. Oh, yes. uh, among the, the people that I interview, I interview um, Christian Otter Bailey, uh, that is um, um, a champion for para surfing. Unfortunately, he lost the use of the legs. I was asking him, like, so how do you? Uh, who's shaping your surfboards, right? Because your surfboards need to have like different kind of uh, technical elements than the, the surfboards used by 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 the by other people, right? And so it, it's interesting also, like that there is a huge amount of people that have different kind of needs, and uh, and surfboard shaping is definitely something that. Uh, uh, can can help them to have a better surf, to have fun, to to spend time in the ocean, and uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's very relevant what you're saying. One of the interesting things you mentioned about the Olympic Games and and surfing in 1956, there was a, an Olympic Games held in held in Melbourne. It was called the Friendly Games, and in conjunction with that, they brought two Californian lifeguards out from. Um, from California, and what they did, um, they put on a surfboard demonstration. They brought out the Malibu chip to Australia, and that changed the whole direction of surfing. And then not only in those Olympic Games, but when we have big events like that, then people's eyes are opened and things change, and not so much that the demonstration by Duke Kahanamoku when he came out for a swimming exhibition or. Greg Knoll and Tom Zahn when they came out with the Olympics, but things surrounding it change. People's eyes are opened and they, they start to think about different things. They'll start to think about technology and things that we didn't have back when Greg Knoll and Tom Zahn came out with their balsa chip from California. We didn't have the technology that we have today. And I, I look at some of the things going on with technology today on how push bikes are 3D digitally printed hollow, yep. very lightweight. And and I think, well, maybe something out of the Olympics this time is going to be some new type of technology that suits a wave pool. They're working in fresh water. They're not working with natural elements. They're working with a, a consistency of wave shape that is just repetition, one after another. And I think because of that, Things will will automatically change. People will make discoveries that they haven't sort of thought about before. Yeah. And just like when the um, the fin systems been introduced, one of the the guys that introduced the uh, FCS system, he was a sander, 
and hated sanding around the fins. And he went, wouldn't it be easy if we just had a couple of plugs that we can screw the fins into? And FCS was born. So such a small thing can yeah. change the whole direction of what surfing is and what surfboards are. And I mean, the shaping machine, obviously, is one of the big things that's changing. But I guess I'm a little bit from the old school where I still do everything by hand. I find that hand-shaped surfboards are a bit like a piece of art as compared to a board that's come off a shaping machine that is a bit more like a print. And a piece of art, original piece of art, has emotion to it and it changes and as the light changes um, on a painting, whereas a print will be the same all the time. Yeah. And I just go, you know, I lived in an era where we surfed a bunch of waves, where we shaped a bunch of surfboards, and um, I've got no complaints about it, but the world's changing and I'm just going, well, I had my time and I had my era and I was happy with it, but I look at it now and I'm going, I'm glad I had what I what I did in the time that I had. Oh, definitely, definitely. And you said a lot of uh, very interesting things. And, uh, of course, you know, like uh, I agree with you that uh, end shaping surfboards are like a piece of art. And for that reason, most a lot of people like, like to collect them, not only to surf them, right? So I'm an artist more than a collector. <laughs> <laughs> So um, uh, anyway, everybody has his own um, has his own uh, way, right? And his own uh, thing. So there was a funny thing that uh, I was thinking because I had um, the opportunity uh, recently to talk with uh, uh, Corky Carroll, like famous surfer, oh, yeah. champion, and he was the first one to be sponsored in US. And he told me, Alessandro, you know, at that time I was sponsored by Obi, and Obi, I, I still believe today that Obi paid me in order for me to stay out of the factory because I was too dangerous in the factory, <laughs> touching everything, bringing cans of beers to the people. And I think I'm still thinking that he sponsored me, not because I was a very good one, but because he wanted me out of the factory <laughs> and surfing. So it was very interesting thing, um, fun at least. In your opinion, we we said what is the most important thing in surfing. In your opinion, what is the most important thing in shaping? There are two things that we have to match up when we're shaping. And one is the person, which is their personality, their weight, their fitness, their attitude. And the other thing is the waves that we want to ride. And the, the purpose of the shaper is to build that vehicle, as I mentioned, that suits both the rider with their ability and all the things that they can do and their idiosyncrasies, whether they might be a bit older and have a bad hip or a bit more weight or whatever, and then build the surfboard that fits. Just like we all need clothes and shoes to fit, yeah. surfboards need to fit. And so by looking at the person and analysing all the different components of the person of, that's going to ride the board, then if you match the person um, to the wave with a, with a vehicle, with a board that sits in the middle, then the, the board becomes the magic surfboard that disappears and it connects the person to the wave. And that's the whole goal of building surfboards. So they disappear when you ride them. Now, the most important thing of shaping um, is the little things. Anyone can get the big things right. Yeah. And what I've found is I have broken down into my um, shaping probably about 65 major parts of a surfboard. So as an example, the rails of a surfboard with the release in the bottom and the softness in the middle and the buoyancy in the top, they can all be adjusted depending on how um, high the board needs to ride in the water, how much direction it needs, how much softness it needs, depending on whether we're riding choppy little beach breaks or whether we're riding long line boards. And then as the board, as the surfer gets better, the board will rise and sit higher in the water because the surfer can generate more speed. And then if the surfer generates more speed, the surfboard works on dynamics rather than on buoyancy. 
And yeah. it's a bit of a, a bit of an illusion that people are talking about literage in surfboards because literage is related to if the surfer is really good, they can ride a really thin surfboard because they can generate the speed by their manoeuvres, by the position on the wave. So the literage helps people on entry level of surfing, not so much surfing itself. So by breaking up all the parts of a surfboard, and it's I often explain it like it's looking at a really nice car driving down the highway and you go, that, that car looks really nice. It's a four-wheel drive. It's nice colour. It's got white leather seats inside it, all of that. But it's the gearbox and the brakes and, and the engine that makes the car work. And people don't go in and go, oh, that's a nice car. What's the valve clearance or <laughs> what's the tension on the brakes or what's the whatever? That's the manufacturer's responsibility, just like it is with the shaper. And as we break down all the components of a surfboard into all the different parts, then we start to go, this person needs more of this and less of that. And it needs to be a little bit softer in the water because the person isn't as competent or these are all the areas that I look at when I'm shaping. So I wouldn't say there's one important thing in as far as a surfboard is concerned. I'd say it's getting all the little things right. It's the little things that, you know, make the surfboard work rather than how it looks and I have people come in and they go, oh, I'll give you the important things first. I want it red with yellow fins. And they leave the rest up to me. Just like if you go in and buy a new car and you go in and buy it by reputation and you're going, I want to buy a Ferrari, but I want it, you know, a particular colour. People don't go in and go, oh, I want to buy a Ferrari and I want you to change the valves or I want you to change this. They just buy it by the appearance. And that's what's happening with surfboards. People are buying by appearance rather than by the understanding of it. So I like to tell people not what to ride, but what all the different things do and let them make the decision. And then when they get on it, they'll go, oh, I want more of this. I want less of that. And then their surfing starts to progress because they're on the right piece of equipment or the waves that they want to ride. And that, that to me is the getting the right surfboard. That's the most important thing. Definitely. Thank you for sharing, you know, like uh, 65 points on the surfboards is like uh, quite major, interesting. Major points. <laughs> yeah, major points. And yeah. I agree with you, you know, when uh, when usually we, we think about custom surfboards, custom surfboards are mu much more than just like I wanted, the uh, I don't know, blue with the white stripe uh, and the big logo, you know, it, it's like... Oh. It's just much more than that, you know, and that makes a, a surfer progress. So I, I, I explain it to people that this is how it works. So you've got body weight, you've got inertia by the performance level of the rider, you've got the size of the wave, and all of these pressures all go down onto the water. Now, water can't be compressed, so what it does, it forces the surfboard to react in a particular way. And when you compress all of this pressure um, of, a, of a surfboard into the, into the bottom of, of or the, the wave into the bottom of a surfboard, the small dynamics that might only be um, very small are all magnified under pressure. It's like if I dropped a watermelon off, off a high point and it had hit the water and it hit it like concrete and smashed, but somebody could stand there and put their foot into it really slowly and there's a totally different effect. So what ends up happening with all of these inertia, body weight, size of waves, and the dynamics that are involved in a surfboard make such a big difference as all of these factors are forced into the back of the surfboard, which makes it perform. So most surfers would know if they change their fins and add a quarter of an inch to the base of a fin, it will magnify the effect of the back of the surfboard. It'll magnify the hold, it'll magnify the drive, it'll do all of those things because of the things of the inertia and the speed and the body weight that we're putting all of these pressures on. Definitely. I was travelling with a, um, a 
one of my um, guys that I build boards for who does reflexology. And he was saying that there are 6,000 nerve endings on the bottom of our feet. And those feet, we're not held in by handles or straps or paddles or anything like that. Those 6,000 nerve endings feel absolutely everything that's going on in the surfboard. They feel the personality of the surfboard. They feel the dynamics. They feel the changes. They feel the material. They feel the flex and the twist and the fins, the fiberglass. I mean, it goes on and on, and you change one of those factors, and then all of a sudden the dynamics of the whole surfboard has changed. So to say that there's one important part, I think we're missing the whole goal of building surfboards. Surfboards are a composite of all of these parts. And I like to say that it's like a simpatico where all of these pieces all fit together Mm. to create the one where it works all together. And if you have one piece that's not quite right, it it, um, makes the rest of them not work to their top function. So chasing all the pieces and getting all the bits right, it's like tuning a fine, you know, a fine automobile. If one of the valves isn't working properly, the the car doesn't work properly. Yeah, It'll still run, but it doesn't work properly. And that's that's my whole philosophy of building surfboards and teaching people what surfboards are all about, that I try to get all of those components right for the person and the waves they want to ride, not only just the person, you know, their body weight and their size, but their attitude and their approach and whether they're a cruiser or whether they're aggressive or whether they just want to, you know, float high or whether they want to do hard, really, you know, hard turns or whether they want to do whatever. These are all parts of the analysis of what a custom shaper should be doing. They should be thinking about the person and the waves they want to ride and build a piece of equipment that's just going to get them excited and make make life good for them. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. I totally agree with you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your career. In your opinion, what was the defining moment of your career? I think I surfed competitively through the 60s, and by the end of the 60s, I'd sort of had enough of competition. And then in the early 70s, they went, oh, we're going back to hold a competition back um, in Margaret River, big big left hand is it sort of like um, sunset in reverse in a way. That's probably the best way to describe it. And I was really successful there. And because of that, I got invitations to go to Hawaii to compete in the Pipe Masters, the Smirnoff, um, the Duke. And I went to Hawaii and com- competed in all of that. And there were really a lot of good surfers from all over the world there. And it was like a um, the Coliseum. Everybody was in there trying to create their career and build the whole thing. And and I sort of went, I'm not really into it that much. All I want to do is go surfing. So about six months later, a friend of mine who was Dick Hull, who was making uh, some surfing movies, said, do you want to come to Bali? And I went, that sounds pretty good. We'd seen a bit of the movie of The Endless Summer and um, we'd I'm sorry, not the endless summer, uh, morning of the earth. And then we sort of went, um, okay, let's go. So I went over there with uh, Rabbit and we surfed some really big left handers. Now, me being a goofy footer, living in Queensland, I'm surfing backhand all the time. So going over there and all of a sudden surfing forehand in really big, long, hollow waves, it just changed my whole approach to, uh, to the enjoyment of surfing. Um, on one really big day, we were surfing um, at Uluwatu and it was probably about 15 to 18 feet and Rabbit and I were the only two guys out there. And Rabbit caught a wave and managed to get back into the cave and I, I caught a big long wave and ended up halfway down the point around towards the next little beach. And as I'm sort of, you know, coming in, I noticed a little corner where the waves were wrapping around. And so later on that um you know, that month, um, I ended up paddling down the coastline all the way from Uluwatu right back through to Cooter and discovered all of those breaks like Padang and Dreamland and Jimmeran Bay and all of that. And that was probably one of the turning points in my excitement of, um, of discovery of surfing, finding breaks that were just perfect. And we went back there the next year and 
uh, Bill Delaney, who made a movie called Free Ride, and Dick Hill made um, surfing movies as well. They filmed it all, and by those by the time those movies had sort of come out, I ended up going to Europe to do some shaping in England and France. And by the time I'd come back, um, the word was out. And now look at it; it's um, Penang has got hotels <laughs> out on the end of it. But for me, going there at that particular time was probably one of the uh, the turning points, I would say, in my life. And the things that led to it were going back and competing in the Australian titles, going to Hawaii and going, what do I want to do? Do I want to compete or do I just want to go surfing? And that was my goal. And by going surfing, I went, I guess I've got to fund it somehow. So I went, well, the only way to fund going surfing is shaping. So that was they were two things that sort of fitted fitted together really nicely, surfing and shaping, and they still are, although I'm not surfing that much these days. I'm you know, getting on in years and getting a bit slower and it's a bit hectic here on the Gold Coast with the uh, the young crew and I. I had my time and now I can leave it to them and um, they can they can have it. Um, so thank you for, for sharing. Uh, in effect, uh, I, I read about uh, you discovering Padang and I didn't really understand. Now I understand. And I, as you said, now it's a hotel. There is the uh, Rip Curl Padang Padang contest there is a lot of uh, a lot of things gravitating around that and you when you discovered there was nobody right so it was like uh, fantastic nobody no, that's right it was um it was a good experience and the story of paddling down from Uluwatu and Padang and all of those things there were lots of little bits and pieces that were you know were good about it one of the interesting little stories that came out of it was that a friend down on the beach at Kuda had a set of shells around his neck. And the only place you could get those shells were on the beaches of Hawaii, and they were called puka shells. And the puka is like in Hawaii is like a hole. If you've got a hole in your surfboard, you've got a puka in your hole. But my purpose did a Playboy spread or a Playgirl spread with a, a naked, you know, lounging picture of him wearing a set of puka shells. So puka shells became quite famous. And this person was on the beach in Kuda and I said, oh, you've been to Hawaii, you've got a set of puka shells. And he said, oh, I've never heard of puka shells, but I found all these po- all these shells on the beach down in Dreamland. So when I paddled from Uluwatu and surfed down through Padang, I found this beach that had was full of puka shells. So I made all these necklaces and sold them to all the guys. I didn't tell them where I got them from, but I sold them to all the guys back in Cuda with the $200 that I made from selling the strings of necklaces, about 20 strings I made. Um, I went and bought 200 barley shirts for a dollar each, I took them to France and sold them there for $25 a shirt, and that paid for my whole European trip. So not only was I just finding a surf break, all of these other little stories sort of ran off it as well, and that was my little adventure off into Europe, which all paid for by shells from uh, from the beach in Dreamland. Very smart of you. It's the second time during the interview that you're telling me uh, that you're trading. You know, first you're saying I trade my board for ten. Now you're trading uh, shells to shirts, shirts to holidays. So <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, and interestingly enough, when I flew from uh, Bali to Europe, I flew through Russia. I went through Moscow at the time and people were going, what do they want in Russia? You know, and people were going, they want ballpoint pens, they want Levi jeans, they want all of these sorts of things. So it was a way that we used to deal and trade, you know. You'd go, okay, I I need somewhere to stay. I've got a, you know, I've got a couple of pairs of board shorts I want to trade or I want my board carried from the Uluwatu Temple down to um, Padang. You know, I'll give you a couple of T-shirts. It was it was just how we did things. Now people are buying all of those things. We just had all that stuff pretty much for free. You know, when we were when we were young and travelling. Now it's um, it's expensive to travel and air flights and you know people are buying surf posters for hundreds of dollars. And I sort of just go, oh, all the things I could have thrown out. And, you know, or that I threw out that I could have saved, but that's one of those things that, you know, could have happened but didn't. 
It's okay. It's okay. A lot of other things happen, so it's okay. In your career, you were saying that you met a lot of uh, surfers all across the world, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people. Was there a particular meeting with a surfer that you was very meaningful for you, that you will remember forever? Yeah, I've, I've made a lot of good friends um, uh, around the world and uh, a lot of uh, good shapers. Um, probably the ones that really stand out would be um, Dick Van Stralen on the coast here. We, we worked together with the Burley Head Surf Company and I learned a lot from Dick. And one of my good friends, uh, Malcolm and Duncan Campbell over in Hawaii, are people that I've uh, keep in touch with. And we have a, a very good headspace between the two of us where we mightn't talk to each other for a year or two and then just carry on like it's just was yesterday. So I'd say probably those those people have been the major influences for different reasons. One, Malcolm and Duncan for their friendship in Hawaii and uh, in California, and uh, and then Dick for his direction here on the Gold Coast. Dick was a um, very um, influential shaper through the 70s and still is today. Amazing, amazing. Thanks a lot. So I have a question, in effect, I, I had a lot of interviews with uh, surfboard shapers, but I never had an interview with a fin maker. And I know that you do amazing fins. And I saw online, um, what's the, uh, the craft behind uh, fin making? Is similar to surfboards? How would you define it? All parts of the surfboard are important. So not only shaping, but uh, glassing, sanding, fins. Um, with modern FCS2 and futures fins, um, I find the bases are a little bit too complex to do by hand, but I enjoy the art side of building fins. I, I enjoy the foil line, and a lot of fins, um, there are two types of foils in fins. One is a parallel foil, and you look at a pattern on a board and the colour if it runs up the back of the fin, is parallel to the back line of the fin. But the other fin that um, is really important is a fin that has an expanding foil. Now, the expanding foil is where the lines of the foil line come off the base and expand as they go towards the top. So what the fin does, it expands. Well, the base is wider um, than the the middle of the fin and then the tip of the fin. So the fin is tapering not only through the foil, but it's tapering through the height of the fin as well. These are things that I really enjoy foiling a fin and getting these lines really nice. And they become um, something that's really quite pretty when you when you shape the line down, like the curves in a wave or the rail line in a surfboard the foil line in a fin becomes a really a pretty thing to look at. Mm. And as much as it's, you know, picking up a, a heavy sanding pad and grinding away fiberglass and resin and getting all itchy and all of that, it's still, um, it's a nice piece of functional art that um, really makes the board work well. And a, and a good fin placed in the right position just can contribute to a really good surfboard. It's just part of what building surfboards is about. And some people go, do you still like sanding? And I'm going, well, sanding is part of building a surfboard. So I like all the parts of building surfboards. I design my own logos. Um, I do all the bits from right from the very beginning right through to the very end of building a surfboard. I like doing it all myself. And there are some great craftsmen out there. There's a a guy down in um, Newcastle called Sam Egan that builds beautiful timber boards, and he's a craftsman, does timber cabinetry work, and I really admire his work that is just um, really pretty to look at, and it has a, a nice sort of feel to it. It's got um, nice um, hand, hand feel. It just looks looks nice, and I think all these things – whether they're fins or rails of surfboard, surfboards, they all should fit and make us feel good. 
Yeah. And if we pick a ball up and it makes us feel good, whether we're a collector or whether we're a rider or whether we're just somebody that likes the, you know, the graphics on it, um, I think all of those things are important. I've got friends that are developing printing on fiberglass. So I look at the big graphic that's in behind you on your uh, the Temple of Surf background there. <laughs> and all of that, it's all printable on fiberglass these days. So you don't have to print it down onto polyesters or things like that. You can just print it onto fiberglass. And even now the technology is that you can print it upside down on the underneath side of the fiberglass. So if you actually touch the fiberglass, you don't take the take the paint off. So these are all things that have been worked on with technology, all part of the building of surfboards. Doesn't matter whether they're, you know, foam and fiberglass or EPS or epoxy, although I'm not a real fan of using epoxy. I'm sort of an old school timber yeah. and, you know, polyurethane and polyester resin. And and I look at all the old blokes that are, you know, been around from the beginning of uh, foam and fiberglass in Australia. And they're all, you know, in their 90s and they're most of them are still, you know, kicking and doing fine. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you. I'm a fiberglass kind of guy. <laughs> Even if uh, today the industry is going in a lot of different direction, but uh, old school, <laughs> like that. You know, it's, it's an era that I grew up in, and I know there's lots of other ways to build surfboards. And, you know, it's, I look at the future and I go, well, the machines are going to get so good that they won't need any hand finishing. And if they don't need hand finishing, then they don't need soft foam. If they don't need soft foam, they probably don't need much of a fiberglass coating. So they can print a sheet of um, fibre plastic and shrink wrap it to the outside of a hard piece of foam. And all of a sudden, there's nobody building surfboards anymore. It's just big companies like tennis rackets or mm. golf clubs or yeah. things like that. So I guess I've come up in an era where Things were handmade. I feel quite privileged to have lived through the 60s and 70s and the 80s where I've had a bit of everything. I've had a bit of the balsa thing to start with. I've seen the development go from long boards into short boards and performance. I've seen single fins into multi fins. I've seen modern technology come through. And I just go, all of it's good, but um, I'm just happy with my lot in life, to tell you the truth. It's just... <laughs> Uh, what I do is what I do, and I just go, "Hey, that's it for me." Just you know, I'm not I'm not going to change. I'm not going to develop into a giant multinational company or anything. I'm just going to build some surfboards and enjoy what I do, and hope the people that you know ride them enjoy them as much as I enjoy building them. Yeah, of course. I I, I hope I hope so. Um, we're going to finish our interview with a short question and answer session. So please answer. The first thing that comes up to your mind, okay? Yep, I'll do my best. <laughs> Let's try. Uh, the best surfboard that you ever ridden? The best surfboard I have ever ridden was a balsa surfboard that I made with um, a company or a business in France with a, a gentleman called Monsieur Barlon, a very famous engineer who used to build parts for the French aircraft industry and he had access to balsa from madagascar and those those slabs of balsa were some of the best slabs of balsa that i have ever seen in my life and i made a uh, a balsa gun out of it all chambered and monsieur ballon had engineering area in his surfboard little surfboard factory off the side of his big engineering company it was so modern compared to compares to what we're doing today and I built that surfboard in that factory and that was the surfboard that I ended up taking back to Bali again so it was the balsa board that I built from uh, at Monsieur Ballon's in uh, in France in 1975. Wow who's your favorite shaper of all time? Oh gee there's so many good ones out there I can't think of who that would be because I think there's a lot of people that have contributed to the best surfboard. Yeah, a lot of people. Okay, fine. Is is a good uh, enough answer as well. <laughs> it doesn't need to be uh, <laughs> the best I can give you. One particular. 
a personal question, your favorite song? I'm a bit of a fan of Bob Dylan. Ah, so uh, um, that would probably be um, one of the uh, one of the favorites that I'd have. Um, and I'd have to go back and, and think about it. But like, like surfboards and shapers, I enjoy a lot of, lot of variety. But as, as somebody that writes music and plays music and is poet, poetic and um, captures a sign of the times, I think all of, those, uh, all of those Dylan songs would be what I'd consider some of the best stuff that I'd like. Of course. I agree with you. Bob Dylan is a legend and an incredible artist. What's your favorite surf spot? Oh, Burley Heads in 1970s. <laughs> 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 we, we didn't have any groins. The sand was tight to the headlands. We had lots of storm swells, so we got lots of big swell. We got lots of power. And because Burley is such a long wave when it's good, and it'd have all these different little sections in it. It'll have little wedgy bits and hollow bits that would drive you down the line. So definitely Burley in the 70s. And I haven't seen much of it like that since then, although looking at the photos of Kira for the last two or three days, I'd say that Kira's probably some of the best waves that I've seen for a long time too. But Burley's my favourite spot. Okay. Who is your favourite surfer of all time? I suppose the most influential surfer um, would, uh, in my era would have been Nat. I saw Nat do a lot of things that um, I hadn't seen done before. When we were in France, he was riding a keel and we were riding eight-foot Hossegor um, and he was riding backhand and the keel was taking him right up into the lip in the top of the waves and I could see the backs of his knees. He was that high in the lip and wow. he was running really big long lines and also in the 60s we surfed Tea Tree together before he went to the world titles in California and even now that longboard surfing is still some of the best longboard surfing that I think I've ever seen even compared to stuff today. But I did an interview years ago and I still get ribbed about it now and they asked me who, who was the best surfer and, and I answered me because I'm the one that's enjoying it the most. <laughs> yes, exactly. I had the, the opportunity to talk with uh, uh, Nat Young uh, like a couple of months ago. It was a very interesting interview. I really like that. So Yeah, no, he's a good, good bloke, and we were competitors together, but over the years we've become good friends. And that's even better, right? So, yes. The last question is a little bit unusual. We ask everyone on the show, but it has nothing yeah. to do with surf. <laughs> so we want to know your best relationship advice. My best relationship advice. Yes. <laughs> um, be nice to everybody. Yeah, I agree with you, right? You gain a lot in doing that. Thanks. Be nice. Everybody's got something good about them. Just be nice to people and life will be good. Yeah, definitely. And if uh, everybody could be nicer, uh, you know, the world would be much better today. So just be nice. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Richard, thank you so much for being with me on the show today. And I look forward to talk to you very soon. Thank you very much too. Enjoyed that. Ciao. Bye bye. Talk soon. Bye. Hi, it's me again. I hope you enjoyed our today's episode. If you want to know more about us, please follow www.thetempleofsurf.com and all our social media. Mahalo!